Erev Tov to everybody. Thank you to everybody for joining on this uh, new and special initiative. It was something that uh, sits on the hearts of each and every one of us, I believe. And it's definitely something that sits on my own heart. And everybody wants to know what can we do to give explanations. This is not for us of what happened in Neron, but we all know it was a tragedy. And we all know that our sages teach us that the living should take to heart. When someone passes, there's a message. There's a message that they leave to all of those that they leave behind. And this is true in every case. But it's especially true in the case of Rabbi Shimon Matalon that we'll see shortly, who not only left us with a spiritual message, but actually a physical message in an incredible note that he wrote that I'll soon introduce to everyone and we're going to take it to heart. I named this series, we're gonna be getting together every Sunday at 8 p.m. Uh, to learn his note. I believe it'll take about four weeks. I named it from alive to living because many times we think that being alive is living, but it's not true. Being alive and living are two separate things. Sometimes our Chachamim teach us that HaRishayim afilu b'chayim nikreim meitim v'atzadikim afilu sheniftarim nikreim chayim that there are those who are alive but are not living, like the walking dead. Those are someone who has no purpose in life, who is living just from the physical sense but not from a psychological, emotional and a spiritual sense. And there are those who might not be alive anymore in a physical sense, but they are definitely living, perhaps even more so after their passing than when they were alive. Those are the tzaddikim because we live by our deeds and our deeds live on even after we are no longer in this physical world. And so we're going to begin investigating this incredible story from Rabbi Shimon Matalon I included over here in the bottom a link that you can go to the Chesed Fund to help out his family. Rabbi Shimon Matlon was only 37 years old, one more, one year older than myself. And he passed away in the Meron tragedy. He was from the city of Beitar Elit. He was also a beloved teacher, had a great smile, and everybody says that he loved his students as he loved his family. And he loved his family like he loved his students. He was a man full of education and wisdom and wanting to help others and a significant member of the community there. Like many other stories, it's quite tragic to see how he ended up in Miron. It was destined. He told his family that he had prayed to Hashem that Hashem will help him to purchase a new car. He needed a new car, but he didn't have the funds. <clears throat> and one miracle led to another. And he said, and uh, finally he was able to make enough money and he was able to purchase a vehicle. And he vowed to Hashem that he would go to the kever of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and Lagba Omer just to say thank you to Hashem for the chesed that Hashem gave to him. And as we know, he did not return home and he leaves his wife and eight children behind. This Rabbi Shimon Matlon had a friend named Yossi Elituv. And he gave this friend Yossi Elituv a note. And he told him to keep the note in his pocket while he was at Miron and not to open it until after Shabbat on Sunday. And as you'll see, this was a very strange note, a prophetic note, almost like a living will and a message to the world before his passing. And so this is the note that Rabbi Shimon Matalon left behind. I have a, we're gonna see it in Hebrew as well as we learn it. He left 10 points over here, we'll read them out loud. And the subject of our series is gonna to be to investigate what he wrote to his friend. It's something so beautiful and so incredible. Let me read it for everybody. Instead of being filled with disappointment, Accept everything with love. Instead of being rigid, be flexible. Instead of complaining, 
let your mind be in control. Instead of harping, be more grateful. Instead of seeing problems, filter out negativity. Instead of drowning in water, know it's all from Hashem. Instead of blaming everyone, remember who is the greatest of all. Instead of getting angry, take a deep breath and stretch. Instead of being upset, exercise your faith. Instead of choosing darkness, choose the full half of the glass. Instead of sinking into despair, remember that everything is a test from God who saves. And he concludes, because God decides what's going to happen, but you decide what your attitude will be. This was the note here, a picture of it, that Rabbi Shimon Matlon wrote, the last thing that he wrote before he passed away in Meiron and gave to his friend. I believe there's so much wisdom to learn in this note. We have so much to learn from this, and may it be uh, in the merit of Rabbi Shimon Matlon and all the 45 Kedoshim who passed away in Meiron. We're going to investigate each one of these lines, starting with the first. Instead of being filled with disappointment, accept everything with love. We're going to take our time. We're only going to see today the first two statements that Rabbi Shimon wrote in his note, because they're so, so deep and so, so fundamental to not only Judaism, but to to a perfect world. So this is Mashiach. If we live by these statements, then we would have brought the world to a time of Mashiach. What is the connection between the two? One thing is not to be disappointed. Another thing is to accept with love. Why are they mutually exclusive? Some of you might know this meme that goes around the internet. There's different videos on it. Expectations versus reality. So here's one. We see here a Lego menorah, the expectation. And what is the reality? <laughs> the little, the little clean uh, menorah over there on the right. And so it's something comedic that goes around, but there's some truth to it. In life, we have expectations. And then we have reality. In a serious note, this is something that gets in our way. This is a major cause of disappointment. We have expectations, and sometimes they are realistic ones, sometimes they're not realistic. And then we have reality, and we look and we wonder why. I worked so hard, this one didn't. Why was that one like this, and but mine was not? Where is the justice? Where is the, the reward for my effort? I have expectations, I set things up, but it didn't go according to plan. Why is reality not matching my expectation? This is a major cause for disappointment in life. But we must know that all expectations, even the realistic ones, are not realistic from the start. Why is that so? Because we don't run the world. We never ran the world. We certainly don't run the world now. So how can we expect to run the world into the future? The world does not run according to our own expectations. It runs according to God's expectations. That doesn't mean we shouldn't have expectations. Expectations help us set goals and to make them achievable. But we have to understand from the get-go that the world operates according to God's plan. Now, which plan is that? Here we'll take things a step deeper. God's plan in the world is plan B. We can read over here on the left side. Everything in the Torah, from the creation of the world, Adam v'chava, Noach, Avram, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Mitzrayim, Yosef v'achiv, Yaakov v'esav, Matan Torah v'chet ha'egel, 40 shana b'midbar, Knisat ha'aretz v'kol ha'milchamot sh'ayu az, everything happened in the Torah not according to expectations. From the very moment in the Midrash, our sages tell us God wanted to create the world, First, he created it with, with uh, strict justice, and he saw that the world couldn't exist. So he decided to create it with only kindness, and he saw the world couldn't exist. So he mixed justice and kindness together and he created the world in Midata Tiferet, in, in, a, in, a, 
in a way of beauty and splendor. But we see from the beginning, things didn't go according to plan. Adam v'chava, the very opening of the Torah, plan B. There was a plan A, Gan Eden, we should live in Gan Eden forever. Just don't eat from the tree. They ate from the tree. Noah, a new world, building up the world. The world has to be destroyed and rebuilt. Avraham and his challenges, who came from, who had to leave his father's household and wander and travel, and all the trials and tribulations that he had, the 10 tests of Avraham Avinu, Yitzchak and the Be'er and the wells that he had to build and that were closed and then uncovered again, and Yitzchak and his brother Yishmael, Yaakov and his brother Esav, Yaakov's children with Yosef, who was sold as a slave into Egypt, Look at the entire Torah. Everything did not go according to plan. What kind of Torah is this? And the answer is that Hashem is trying to teach us an incredible lesson. And the lesson is that unmet expectations is reality. Let the world work according to God's plans because the plans will never go according to our own. Setting goals is healthy. But there is no reason to be disappointed when things don't go our way, because they never go our way. And not only that, but God created the world and shared with us in his Torah this wisdom that things will never go in the way we expect them to. And so we should be ready to build off them in a, in a positive direction. Let me share with you just a little piece of wisdom that I, that I use from time to time. I'm sure many of us can relate, although more recently less so, about traffic. You know, Toronto, before Corona, traffic was intense. You wanted to go down Bathurst, it should take 10 minutes. It took you 35, 40 minutes. You want, wherever you want to go, now the roads are a little bit more clear. It's a little bit easier. But traffic, the mashu merzev. Who doesn't get upset? Who doesn't have road rage? Who's not upset when traffic uh, prevents them from getting to where they want to go? It's a waste of time, seemingly. But if we remind ourselves that the world works according to God's plan, then traffic could be the biggest blessing. It's an opportunity for a person to stop and to realize that I can't push the gas and go any faster, and I can't stay on the brakes and go any slower. I'm going to get to where I'm going whenever God wants me to get there. If you stop and you think that when you're in traffic, so you go with the flow, you realize that the world is working to expectations, just not our own. It's difficult because when we don't know the outcome and our GPS also doesn't know the outcome, it's very hard to live with that. But that is, in fact, the way God created the world. So we should never be disappointed when expectations don't meet reality. I want to share another reason for disappointment in life. And that's a major one. That's failure. How many of us feel disappointed when things don't go according to plan, when things don't work out? But how much more so when we took a role in that? When things didn't work out because we made the wrong decision. We failed. How is that not disappointing when it's a result of our own effort? And we're going to investigate each one of these key points. They're beautiful, beautiful points to live by, which are all based on this foundational quote here. The divine design of creation includes failure as part of human growth. Failure is part of the way God created the world, as we saw in the previous slide. Number one, failure does not affect our essential goodness. Something for those of us who were in the previous uh, English JLI course called Complicated Me, we spoke about failure and how to see failure. There's actually studies that try and investigate our essential nature. Studies out of Yale University that were conflicting. Are people inherently good-natured, sharing, caring, wanting to be part of a community and help others? Or are people essentially self-centered? They did studies. They found out that children are self-centered. Children, first of all, care for themselves, and they, they will even suffer in order that the other one shouldn't have more than them. On the other hand, they saw in other studies on, on older children and, and adults that the first instinct of a person is to help another. It's when we go and we think again and we think twice and we do the cheshbonot that we begin to think about how will it affect us and we make a decision that benefits us versus others. And so we see this conflict that 
that scientists and sociologists are trying to understand, are we essentially good or not? We'll see shortly what the answer is. Secondly, failure does not uproot our successes. When we fail or we experience failure in life, we forget all about the goodness that we had in the past, all about the right, the, the things that went right in the past. But this is very hard to, to, this is part of the way that the world runs. Think about it as a student in school. If you get a hundred on a test and then you get a 50 on a test, what happens to that hundred? It's gone. You now have a 75 if the tests were weighted equally. I see this all the time with our students that come to our, our youth programs. Every student makes a calculation at some point in their career. This is my grade. I know how much the weight of the future tests are going to be. Here is the maximum grade that I can accomplish. And based on that, that's how much effort I'm going to put in. A student already knows two months before the final how much effort they need to put in to achieve whatever grade they can. Some grades might be not achievable and some grades are. This is obviously not the right way to educate our children. I don't know what he's talking about. Charlie. It's, not, it's obviously not the right way to educate our children that our previous failures will uproot our, our previous successes should be doomed based on our current failures. Thirdly, failure leads to growth. Incredible growth can come out of failure. Not only growth, but it leads to new opportunities and growth. And finally, something so important for our generation is to understand that success is not the opposite of failure. We live in a generation that's based on outcomes. You either succeeded or you failed. Did you get the grade or you didn't get the grade? Did you get the money or you didn't get the money? Did you seal the deal or you didn't seal the deal? Did you get the sale or you didn't get the sale? Was it a success or not? Effort doesn't give you an A. You get an E for effort. A, you get based on outcomes. And so we'll see how we can change that and understand that from a Jewish perspective, especially in our modern day and age. So we'll begin with the first point, which is that failure does not affect our essential goodness. I want to share with you a beautiful story that was shared by the author of Lessons in Tanya, Rabbi Yosef Weinberg. This is a story that goes back to 1945. Rabbi Yosef Weinberg was living in the city of Chicago, and he received a visit from one of the previous Rebbe's emissaries, Rabbi Shmuel Levitin. An elder Chassid, somebody who came out of the, the Russian Stalinist re regime and lived with Mesirut Nefesh his whole life. This Rabbi Shmuel Levitin was sent to Chicago to meet a certain Mr. Listner, who is a successful businessman and also a descendant of Chabad Hasidim, whose, whose ancestors had a relationship with the Lubavitcher Rebbe's. When he arrived in Chicago, he went to visit Mr. Listener in his business office. It was a very warm welcome. Mr. Listener offered him some tea and they had a conversation. After the meaningful conversation, the businessman pulls out his checkbook and he asks, who should I make the check out to? Rabbi Levitin told him, put away the checkbook. I was not told to come here to collect money. I won't even take your donation, even if you write it. Mr. Nissen was surprised. So, so what did you come here for? <laughs> you came here just to have some tea in my, in my office. And so Rabbi Levitin to told him, let me tell you a story. You know, back in the small towns in Russia, when people needed to have the mezuzah checked, or a Torah scroll needed to be checked, or tefillin needed to be checked, you need a scribe, a sofer, to check it. But not every town has a sofer. So how would they get it checked? A sofer would go out from the bigger cities and travel from village to village, from town to town. When he would arrive in a town, he would take the different parchments, the different tefillin, the different mezuzot, and he would check them. Sometimes the ink would fade. Sometimes the letters would crack or tear. And the sofer would fill in the blanks and fix up the letters and then be off on his way. 
Mr. Listener, said Rabbi Levitin, every Jew is like that Torah scroll. Every Jew is a living Torah scroll. Sometimes we have letters of our Judaism that get rubbed off. Our letters crack. We lose touch with Torah and mitzvot. I am like a traveling sofer. I come from place to place just to add a little bit of spiritual ink, a little bit of inspiration to inspire you and to make you whole once again in your connection to Hashem. Mr. Listener was wowed by this beautiful parable, very inspired, and Rabbi Levitin returned to New York to report to the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe. When he reported his story, the Rebbe was silent. And Rabbi Levitin was a little bit nervous. Perhaps I said something incorrect. Uh, isn't every Jew like a Torah scroll? And the previous Rebbe told him, it's indeed true, your analogy. However, there's one key important difference. A Torah scroll is written with ink on parchment. And there remain two separate things. The ink can separate from the parchment. But a Jew and Torah, a Jew and mitzvot, a Jew and their connection to Hashem can never ever be separated. This is like the, the commandments, the luchot, which were engraved. They were not written like with ink on parchment. They were engraved into the stone and can never be separated from the stone. But what happens over time, the stone can gather dust. It can get muddy. It can get dirty. But all you need is a traveling scribe to come by, to brush away some of the dust, to blow on it a little and give it a little inspiration and the letters will shine. And that's what he taught us, that the letter remains whole. No matter what mistake we make, no matter what area we fail, we should never be filled with disappointment because we are always essentially good as we are created in the image of Hashem. The second point Rabbi Shimon wrote in his letter is that failure does not uproot our successes. You know, anybody who learned a little bit of Hasidut knows that one of the fundamentals of Hasidut is to not be a fool. Yes, to not be a fool. And more importantly, not to fool others. More important than that is not to fool oneself. That could be the biggest tragedy. To fool oneself could be the largest tragedy that can happen. And so it's important that we have moments of self-introspection, moments that we consider our deeds and our actions and we criticize ourselves in order to grow. However, perhaps just as important, if not more important than that, is to know our positive qualities. Sometimes, you know, in society we think, that to know our positive qualities is to build up our ego, to have a healthy self-esteem. But we'll see that, in fact, knowing our positive qualities is not only to have a self healthy self-esteem, but it can actually lead to even greater growth. As Rabbi Sholem Dober of Lubavitch said, just as a person ought to know his shortcomings, so too he should know the positive qualities that he possesses. Part of that chesh bona nefesh is to also know all of your successes, which can never be uprooted despite any failure. And I quoted here beautifully, Rabbi Sholem Dovber's son, the previous Ubavid Rebbe, continued that quote from his father with an interesting perspective and said, but also the positive qualities that he does not possess. Meaning, we, we always have to strive for more and know that we have more positive qualities that we just don't possess them yet. And this is a way to move forward in a positive direction, knowing that failure does never uproot our success. Furthermore, failure leads to new growth. This is an incredible concept. We see King Solomon, Shlomo Melech writes in Mishlei, a righteous person, a tzaddik, sheva yipol, seven times he will fall, the kam, and he will rise. But the wicked shall stumble in evil. It's an incredible thing teaching us that a tzaddik can fall. That even somebody who's completely righteous can fall, and not only that, will fall. Well, if that's the case, then why do we call him a tzaddik? If somebody fails, don't they lose the title tzaddik? 
They failed once, twice, three times, four times, seven times. Failure. And yet, Shlomo HaMelech says, this is a tzaddik. Why? Because he rises up after each fall. It's not the falling that is up to the person. It's what you do after the fall that makes him into the tzaddik. There's a beautiful story. I don't know the accuracy of it. I mean, you might have heard it before. But the, in the early years of IBM, when IBM was becoming one of the largest companies in the world, there was a, a person that worked in the executive board who made a very big mistake that cost the company literally millions of dollars. After realizing that, realizing that he made the mistake and everybody in the company realized the mistake, he wrote his letter of resignation and handed it in to the, to the committee. His boss, the CEO, looked at him and told him, there's no way that I'm going to fire you now. We just spent a million dollars on your training. We can't fire you now. But that million dollar mistake, now that person learned from that mistake something that that no one else could learn. That was, those, those million dollars were an investment in that person's training. The failure is an investment in success. Failure leads to new growth. It can take us to new places that we could have never achieved before. In an even deeper sense, when we fail, we become broken. Our shell breaks. You look at the pieces of yourself lying on the ground. But now you can escape. Your shell is broken. Now there are no limits to how tall you can grow. When the shell breaks, when the shell of comfort, when the shell of stagnation, when the shell of, of met expectations and realistic goals is finally broken, when God serves us a different expectation than the one we were, when we were hoping for, so our shell is broken. It's a blessing. The, the chicken and the egg is supposed to be happy and to rise up and to grow, to be something new. Just like a seed that's planted into the ground in order to transform into a tall and beautiful tree needs to first lose its identity of being just a seed. It needs to disintegrate. It needs to lose itself. It needs to break free from its shell and join in with the earth and with the water and with the sunlight so that it can grow and become something new. Only failure can take you there. And lastly, success is not the opposite of failure. I want to take us through this in just three steps of understanding this. In the Talmud, Masechet Megillah, Rabbi Yitzchak taught, if somebody says, I have worked hard, but I have not been successful, don't believe him. Yagati velo matzati al tamin. If someone says, I have not worked hard and I have been successful, don't believe him. Lo yegati umatsati al tamin. If someone says, I have worked hard, yagati, and I have been successful, umatsati, tamin. That you shall believe. This is one of the psukim, one of the aphorisms, the quotes that the Lubavitcher Rebbe wanted every man, woman, and child to learn and to live with by heart. But we have to understand what exactly is going on here. Look at the middle quote. If somebody says, I have not worked hard, but I have been successful, don't believe him. What do you mean don't believe him? He's saying, I, I'm successful. I succeeded. I, I got the sale. I got the money. I, I sealed the deal. I got the grade. I got what I wanted. I'm successful. And you don't believe him. Only he knows the value of the success. Because he didn't work hard, that takes away from his success. And the answer is yes. Because success is a result not just of the outcome, but of the process. Just like this young man over here on the peak of this mountain. Where is his success? That he is standing on the top of a mountain or that he climbed a mountain that's higher than the clouds? You can imagine for a moment a hiker who's climbing up a mountain that takes two weeks to climb. 
A week into his climb, he's starving, he's broken. The terrible weather, sleeping outside under rain, under cold, animals. He's beaten up from his climb. And then his friend comes up on a helicopter and he sees his friend suffering on his two week journey up the mountain. And he tells his friend, jump on my helicopter. Why are you climbing? I'm going to the peak. I'm going to be there in 10 minutes. What will the friend tell him? Yeah, let me jump on the helicopter. They'll tell him, no way, my friend. I didn't come here just to be on the peak. I came here to climb the mountain. The whole reason of the mountain has the peak is so that there should be a mountain beneath it to climb. True success is a result of our effort and our progress and our, and our, our toiling and not a result of the outcomes that come at the end. Einstein said that success is failure in progress. There's, a, there's another quote from Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan said that he has missed 9,000 shots, 300 games he has lost, and he has blown 26 buzzer beaters in his career. And because of all those failures, he became the star that he was. There are many quotes you can look them up. There's incredible stories of people that became successes because of their failures. Oprah Winfrey is one of them. J.K. Rowling was, is one of them. And many, many others who failed and only then succeeded. But all those still fall short of the true Jewish perspective on success. Because they still put the emphasis on the outcome. Yes, you failed, but you can still come back. Yes, you failed, but you could start something new. But what happens to that failure? And more, what happens to all of us who are not the Michael Jordans, who don't become the Einsteins, who aren't the J.K. Rowlings when we write our novels and our short stories? What happens to our failures? It's hard to understand because their failures, you see in the perspective, in the contrast of their success. But we have to redefine success. The Jewish secret of failure is that the solid attempt and effort itself is a success. Failure does not only bring us to better outcomes, to more success, but the failure itself is part of the success. Success, as we said, is the journey and not the outcome. As the first Chabad Rebbe, the Altar Rebbe writes in his magnum opus, Sefer Atanya, Chapter 27, even if you shall be so all your days embroiled in this battle, he's describing the, the spiritual battle within a person between the good nature and the evil nature, between the self-centeredness and the, and, the, and the otherness that exists within a person. Why should a person, should, if, even if a person will be so all his days, for perhaps for this purpose, you were created. And this is your God-given mission says the Alta Rebbe. Perhaps a person was put onto this world not in order to totally destroy their self-centeredness, to totally de destroy, to change their ego, to become a new and a better person. Perhaps they were put on this earth because God wanted their struggle. God wanted their journey. God wanted their effort to become a better person and not the results. This was the whole purpose that a person was created to be in a mode of battle, meaning the success is in the fight, not in the outcome. This is the true Jewish take on success. The second point that Rabbi Shimon wrote in his letter, instead of being filled with disappointment, to accept everything with love, is something also an incredible point to make, to accept everything with love. Everything, obviously, he's referring to, to trials and tribulations, to challenges in life. Again, as King Solomon, as Shlomo HaMelech writes in Mishlei, Musar Hashem b'ni al timas. My son, despise not the discipline of the Lord. Ve'al takots betokachto. Do not 
be do not abhor, do not be disgusted by his chastising you, by his punishing you. Ki et asher Hashem yochiach. Because who does God challenge? Who does God rebuke? The one that he loves. Ukeav et ben yirtzeh, just like a father placates a son through punishment, through setting boundaries, through setting boundaries and giving challenges for the son to overcome, the parent does it out of love of their child in order that that child should grow. It's like if you can imagine a player on a, on a sports team, a professional football player. He works hard, wakes up five in the morning, runs laps, pushes his body to the limit, to the maximum. You would think that the player, after working so hard, does not want the coach's attention. He doesn't want to draw too much attention because he knows he's going to have to run 20 more laps. He knows that if he does a little, you know, if he succeeds a little too much, the coach is going to push him even harder. But that's not true. What makes a person a professional player, a part of the team, is that they want the coach's attention. They want to be challenged. They want to run the 20 extra laps. They need somebody outside of themselves to push, the, push their envelope, to break their shell, and to bring them to new heights to make them an even better player. So the same is true in life when, we, when sometimes we don't have the strength to break free from our own shell and God breaks it for us. But he does it out of love. Why out of love? Because what these two fundamental principles that are philosophical in nature, but quite practical when we apply them. Accepting everything is one level. It's enough to request of somebody to just accept life's challenges. But Rabbi Shimon Matlon wrote more, accept life's challenges with love. How do we do that? And the answer is that God created every minute detail of creation out of his free will. Nothing and no one forced Hashem to create the world. Hashem simply created the world because he wanted to, and that is an act of love, an act of total selflessness. Not because I need something, I'm doing it for you. Everything that happens in this world is imbued with that love because God's constant hashkacha is involved with this world. We call it hashkacha pratit. Every single place in the world, every single moment in the world, every person in the world is under God's constant watchful eye, loving eye. And that love, and maybe even more so during the challenges and difficulties of life, is ever so present. Just like the player, who does the coach give the hardest time to? To the one he thinks can succeed the most. Or a teacher and a student. When, a diff when there's a difficult student, it arouses a part in the teacher that, that wants to help that student even more. And he gives his attention to that student. It shouldn't be in an unhealthy way. But he gives more attention to that student to lift up that student and to bring them to a new level out of love. And so if that is the case, then in this world, we must accept all of our challenges and realize that it's coming from a place of love in Hashem, and we should reciprocate and, and accept that with love. I want to share with you this beautiful story involving the Lubavitcher Rebbe and Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm in 1983, the first elected Black Congresswoman in America. And she had a relationship to the Lubavitcher Rebbe since she was a congresswoman representing the area of Crown Heights as well. An incredible story about seeing failure as part of the success and accepting things with love.
She was a fiery speaker. She was considered a black power advocate. Whites were scared silly of her. And she was the first black woman ever elected to the United States Congress, and she was a bomb thrower. So the, uh, the white Southern racists that ran the U.S. House of Representatives from the South said, we'll teach this blank a, 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 a lesson. And they assigned her to the Agricultural Committee of the House of Representatives. It was a great it was a great joke. I still remember the New York Times front page article said, does a tree grow in Brooklyn? Question mark. I said, you know, the, the chairman, they've appointed Shirley Chisholm, not the housing which she requested, not to a committee on poverty, but the Agriculture Committee. And she, when she retired from the House, I was there when she told the following story. She said she was very depressed, very upset. I didn't know what to do. She got a phone call from Bobby Trey. I wanted to see you. Of course, she she was the congresswoman from Crown Heights. She had helped win the election, the primary, with the strong support of Obamacare. She, she has a very close relationship with people in the Crown Heights community. And she came to see her. She, as he told the story, she had seen him once before when he had refused to give her an endorser. But then she said, everyone voted for me, so I guess he did something. She was very cute about that. She said, but then she came to see him the second time. And he sat down and said, I know you're very upset. She said, I am upset. I'm insulted. What should I do? And he said, what a blessing God's given you. This country has so much surplus food, and there's so many hungry people. And you can use this gift that God's given you to feed hungry people. Find a creative way to do it. And she says, the first day she came to Washington, she met a young congressman who's now a world famous figure, Robert Dole, from Kansas. And they started talking, and he said, you know, we, our farmers have all this extra food. We don't know what to do with it. She said, one second, the rabbi. And what we call Wiccan food stamps largely expanded. It was a tiny pilot program before the whole existing food stamps program. I kept that agriculture committee of the United States Congress and Shirley Chisholm said in front of everyone there in Washington, she said, I owe this because a rabbi who was an optimist taught me optimism, taught me that when God gives, when, when you make things a challenge, they get from God. She said, if poor children, babies, I heard her say, she said, poor babies have milk, if poor children, children have food. This was the this rabbi in Crown Heights had vision. So that's an incredible story of Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm being given a, a new opportunity, a new perspective from the Lubavitcher Rebbe uh, based on her, so to speak, failure, based on the challenge that she was given to turn that and to make it into something that affects the world even to today. The next point I want to bring out from the letter that Rabbi Shimon Matlon shared with the world before his passing Instead of being rigid, be flexible. I wish we could. this could be a mantra for all of us. Instead of being rigid, be flexible. I believe we have to say it to ourselves many times a day. Bimkom liot nuksha, liot gamish. Liot gamish. As it says in the Talmud, Masechet Ta'anit, be flexible like a reed, rach kakane, and not brittle like the cedar trees, the tall cedar trees. I want to share with you this beautiful Gemara. We're going to have just a little taste of text over here from Masechet Ta'anit. In the Gemara, it shares as follows. It's discussing Achia Hashiloni. For those who don't know, Achia Hashiloni was one of the prophets in the end of the days of Shlomo HaMelech. He lived past the time of Shlomo Melech when Shlomo passed away. And he was he prophesied about the splitting of the Jewish nation, the 10 tribes and the two tribes. And um, prophesied when King Shlomo's son, Rechavam, took the throne. He was a very mysterious figure. Not much is known about him. But we do know that he also prophesied about the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash because of the way the Jewish nations were behaving, and we know that he was the teacher of Eliyahu Navi. So this is the Achia Shiloni. He cursed the Jewish peoples. He was upset. He was cursing them, saying, if this is the way you behave, look at what the results will be. And he said in his Nivuah, for Hashem will smite Israel as a reed is shaken in the water. Just like a kane is shaking in the water, so to Hashem, will curse the Jewish people. Rav Yehuda said in the name of his teacher, Rav, Gamzu Bracha. 
this too is for a blessing. It's a section in the Gemara where they were reinterpreting curses as blessings. How so? How is this a blessing? It seems like Achia is giving a curse, a klala. So Rabbi Yochanan explained, although it seems to be a curse, this verse is actually a blessing. Just as the reed stands in a place of water and its shoots replenish themselves when cut. You can cut the reed, but it grows again. And its roots are numerous for a plant of its size. And even if all the winds in the world come and blow against it, they cannot move it from its place. It sways with them until the winds will subside and the reed still stands in its place. The same applies to the Jewish people. After all the difficulties that they endure, they will ultimately survive and return home. Why? Because of the flexibility. The cedar tree grows tall. It grows strong. It's thick. Its, it's trunk is massive and it gives off a good impression. But because it is so rigid, when the wind comes that's strong enough, the tree will crack, the tree will break, and it will fall. But the reeds that are always connected, they stay in the water, they stay in their roots, and they sway with the wind. They move with the challenges. They're flexible. That allows them to remain and be even stronger than the cedar tree. An interesting aside, in the same Gemara over here on the top, they quote, Again, the wisdom of Shlomo al-Melech. Listen to these beautiful words. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. An incredible statement which also speaks about, about uh, what we're going to discuss, which is to love to, love to be chastised. Where faithful are the wounds of a friend. When a friend gives us rebuke, it's good for you. But when your enemy kisses you, that you should stay away from. That's deceitful. As Rabbi Shmuel Ba Nachmani said in the name of Rabbi Yochanan, the curse which Achia Shiloni cursed the Jewish people, which we just saw, was more effective than the blessing of which, which Bil'am HaRasha blessed them. As we know in the story with Bil'am, when Balak sent the sorcerer of Balaam to curse the Jewish people, and God kept on turning his curses into blessings, his greatest blessing doesn't even come close to the curse of Achia Shiloni because Achia was cursing from a place of friendship and of love. Another story from the Talmud, Masechet Yevamot, says, Rabban Gamliel, I was once traveling on a ship, recounted the great sage and leader of the Jewish Supreme Court, Rabban Gamliel. When I saw another ship that had been wrecked, my heart grieved especially for one of its passengers, the Torah sage, Rabbi Akiva. The teacher of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, Rabbi Akiva was on that boat that sank. When I reached land and resumed my studies, says Rabbi Gamliel, I suddenly saw him sitting before me and discussing halachic matters with me. When, when Rabbi Gamliel inquired as to who had rescued him from the sea, Rabbi Akiva replied, A board from the ship came my way, and I clung to it. When each wave came surging towards me, I bowed my head, letting it pass over me. A beautiful lesson as well from this Gemara that we can learn out from Rabbi Akiva. In life, we sometimes feel like we are drowning. The waves are coming and coming. Our ship has wrecked. Our ship is sunk. There's no ship to return to. And the waves you have no control over. How big the wave will, will be, when the wave will, will be. But look at what Rabbi Akiva did. He bowed his head out of humility. He, out of self-subjugation. Uh, he bowed down and he let the wave pass over him. And with that, he finally was able to flow back to the shore. You cannot fight the waves as the saying goes, but you can learn to surf. And so we see that we must be flexible like the reeds. Another few points about flexibility, and we'll conclude with a story. Flexibility is a sign 
of self-confidence. What requires more inner strength? To stay rigid and to stay without seeing other perspectives and just to say, what's my way is my way and my way is right? Or does it require much more self-confidence to go outside of our comfort zone and to see things from someone else's perspective? To be vulnerable and to appreciate somebody else. In order to do that, you need to have a strong foundation. You need to have a strong self-identity. When we're not sure of ourselves, we put our guards up and we become like the cedar tree. We become inflexible. Flexibility comes from recognizing that you are not in control because you go with the wind as the reed does and you let the waves pass because they aren't your waves. You didn't create them and you let them go. The waves of life will, will flow and will, will go over you and sometimes over your head. The only way to get unstuck is to wiggle. When we get stuck in a physical sense, you can't stay in the same position and expect to get out. You need to wiggle. You need to move. You need to change where your, your position in order to get out of your place of being stuck. So too in life, you have to be flexible. You have to be able to move into transition to get yourself unstuck. Bending allows one to go beyond one's self. You can never go beyond yourself if you don't bend. You only grow taller and taller in your own ego and your own self and definition of life if you grow like the cedar tree. In order to bend, then you must be flexible and you go outside of yourself. And here is the key point. Plants that are rooted well, stay flexible. When your roots are unwavering and strong, then your branches can bend. Like in the example of the reeds that grow in the water, they stay true to their source of life. They have many, many roots. They have a strong foundation. So too, every Jew must have a strong foundation, a strong Jewish education, a strong understanding of our Torah, a Torah of truth and the principles of the Torah that gives love and guidance to the world. When we have those strong shorashim, then we can bend, then we can be flexible, then we can appreciate and see. But when we don't have those shorashim and we're not attached to the ground, when our roots are not planted, then when the wind comes, we will blow away with the wind, God forbid. And so the key of flexibility is to have your shorashim planted deep and well into the ground. And so there was a story once, the Rebbe Rashab, the fifth, Lubavitcher Rebbe was taken to see various works of art. One of them was a beautiful painting that an expert artist had made of a farm, a field. It had all the things that a farm would have, and it was very, very realistic. Somebody next to the Rebbe was saying how realistic the, this picture was, that it really looked like, like uh, you felt like you were at the farm. Every detail was perfect. Next to him, there was a simple farmer, not an artist, not an educated intellectual, a simple farmer who worked on the farm for a living. And he said, indeed, the picture does look beautiful and it gives the impression of being alive. But if you look at the bird that's perched on the wheat stalk, you'll see there is a mistake. Because in that, in that painting, when the bird was sitting on the wheat stalk, the wheat stalk did not bend. It was straight. And the farmer said, when a bird perches on a stalk of wheat, the wheat will bend. The Rebbe Yashab said, I was taught from the Baal Shem Tov and our Rebbeim and our teachers that everything we see and hear in life must be a lesson in our service of Hashem. And the lesson that he took out from this was, that one's divine service, our Avodat Hashem, our work in this world, can look beautiful and can give the impression of being alive. However, if it's lacking the ability to bend, to be submissive to God's will, to be submissive to God's expectations, then it ceases to be real. True goodness can only be achieved by transcending the limitations of one's personal ego. And that is the secret 
of being rach kakane velo kashe ka'erez. Next week, we'll go on and investigate further. Well, not next week because it's Shavuot. Sunday night begins Shavuot. We'll begin the week after Shavuot, going further into this incredible letter, Rabbi Shimon Matlon, instead of complaining, let your mind be in control. May this lesson be in his chut, in his memory. May his neshama have an aliyah along with the neshamot of, of all the niftarim. May Am Yisrael have a yeshua, not only from the trials and tribulations of Galut, but from our own inner personal exile. We should change, we should be better people, more welcoming, more, more loving, and have more Ahavat Yisrael. This is what we've been hearing from the families of all those victims in Meron that are all calling out that we should reach out from Avat Yisrael to call our neighbor, to call our friend, to call our family, and to reach out with love and to create those connections. And with that, may we merit to have Mashiach speedily in our days.